We've been uh, uh, walking through the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And tonight, we're at the prophet Micah. Micah. Um, um, the name Micah means, who is like God? And uh, he was a prophet of Judah. He lived about the same time as Isaiah. See, in the very first verse of Micah chapter 1, uh, I put, and Lou, I, put, I just put all the chapters on there. We're not going to look at every verse, but you'll have to pick and choose for me. But chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morasite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That places him in the same time as Isaiah. And a lot of his themes are the same as Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is a much larger prophecy, 66 chapters. Micah is only seven. Yet in Micah, in this short prophecy, he covers, just like many of the other prophets, all of them so far except Jonah, have looked into the future, uh, the future of, of the prophet and the future of us, really, in the future of where we are, we're at right now. They looked into the first and second advent of Jesus Christ, and we're going to see that uh, this evening here in Micah. One thing you have to understand, that when the Old Testament prophets looked into the future, they did not see the church age. They did not see the separation. You know, we believe that Christ came uh, 2,000 years ago, was crucified, uh, and he's returning again. And when he returns again, he's going to establish his kingdom, a millennial kingdom. He's going to uh, come here first to, to take the church up, to rapture the church, and then to establish his kingdom seven years later. But the, the Old Testament prophets, when, they, when God allowed them to see in the future, he did not show them the, what we call the church age, the time we're living in now. So many of their prophecies uh, like run together, the first advent and the second advent of Jesus Christ, to them look like, one, look like one event. So we have to keep that in mind whenever you're reading any of the Old Testament prophets, that they saw the coming of Christ and the coming of Messiah, the anointed one, and the establishment of the kingdom is like one event. We, of course, know that it's two, that, that there was that gap in between. I, I likened it before, and I've read this before. It's like when you stand on a mountain and you look at two mountains, if you look in the distance and you see two mountains, it looks like they're right next to each other, but you can't see the valley in between them. And that's pretty much the way things were with the Old Testament prophets. God did not reveal to them the mystery of the body of Christ, the mystery of the church. It wasn't until the Apostle Paul, that mystery was revealed to him. He talked about that in, in his letter to the Ephesians, how God chose him to show him the, the mystery of the, of the cross and, and the things that, the age of grace that we live in today. But the Old Testament prophets didn't see that, but they did see the coming of the Lord. Now, if you look in chapter 1, and we're just going to skip through the chapters here in Micah. We're not going to read every verse. But um, like the other prophets, Micah spoke judgment and restoration. He spoke judgment and restoration. There were, there were things that the nation of Israel, and, and he prophesied both to Judah, although he was primarily a prophet to Judah, he also prophet, prophesied to the northern kingdoms. And he prophesied against their idolatry and against their wickedness, and he, he talked about the judgment of God, and he also talked about the restoration that would come. I thank God that God doesn't speak judgment unless he speaks also restoration. There's always... You know, the judgment is never just to eliminate the judgment for his people. The judgment is never to just get rid of them. The judgment is to correct them. And we see throughout, his, throughout the Old Testament in the prophets the same pattern over and over and over again. Uh, looking at verse 2 in chapter 1 again, we're just going to skip through here for time's sake. He says, Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord comes forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountain shall be molten under him and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. He is seeing here the very beginning of his prophecy. He's talking about when Jesus Christ comes in judgment, the day of the Lord. Now that day hasn't happened yet. When Christ came the first time, he took judgment on himself for us, that through faith we might have forgiveness of sins. But when he comes again, if you turn to Revelation chapter 19, we're not going to turn there, but if you read that, he comes as a conquering. He comes you know, uh, with a, 
flame, fires coming out, fire coming out of his eyes, and a sword, the word of God coming out of his mouth. He has a vesture dipped in blood, says, King of kings and Lord of lords. When he comes back the second time, he's going to be a conquering king. And this is what Micah, God allowed Micah to see in the future, that when, when God sends his anointed one to this earth to establish his kingdom, you know, a lot of people say, oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, you better be ready for when he comes. A lot of folks don't know what they're asking for when they ask for that. As believers, as those who have been, we're under the blood of Jesus Christ, we can say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because we know that when he comes, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to take us out here and, and it's so we might be with him. And then we'll return with him according to God's word. But, you know, there's a lot of folks, you know, they're looking for God to do this. You've got to watch out because the day of the Lord is going to be a day of judgment. And this is what Micah is speaking about. He's sending warnings. He's talking about judgment. In verse 5, he states the sin. He says, for the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? What he's talking about here is the idolatry that the Israelites fell into. Again, rehearsing the history of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes that broke off from, uh, from Jerusalem after the death of Solomon, they immediately made two golden calves and set them up as items of worship, as idolatry. And eventually, later, the, 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 in Jerusalem, Judah and Benjamin, who were in Jerusalem, they fell into the same kind of idolatry. If you read through the prophets, Ezekiel, God allowed Ezekiel to go into the, the inner chambers of the temple where they had, they had pictures of creeping things and pictures of, of uh, evil things that they worshipped. Uh, so they had fallen into idolatry. And again, we say this is a picture of the same thing that we see happening today. Uh, idols, idolatry, idol worship, even though we don't have, uh, we don't worship pictures of animals, or some do, I, you know. But we have all other kinds of things we worship. We worship, we worship money, we worship bling, we worship, you know, we worship people, we worship sports figures. Everybody has somebody that, that they put before, somebody or something that they put before Jesus Christ. Not everybody, but as a culture, is what I'm saying, is as a people. There are things that we think are so much more important than God. So this was what the judgment was coming. This is the pronounced judgment. Uh, look at chapter 2. And again, now he's talking about the sins of Israel. And see if this just makes any sense to you today. It's amazing how these prophets that lived 2,500 years ago, 2,700 years ago, are saying things that are pertinent today. He says this. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. <laughs> well, for those people that sit around just thinking ways, just devising ways that they can get over on other people. You know, there's, I mean, that's a big business. That's, there's a lot of money. You know, this, this, the last couple of years, the housing bust, you know, that didn't, that wasn't an accident. There was folks that figured out how they could cash in, you know, the ones who, who ran Enron. Man, they figured that thing out. They had, their, they had everything padded, you know, so when they pulled the plug, they had theirs, but everybody else didn't. They, I mean, they just, they just lay on their beds trying to figure out how they can get over. Uh, it says, they look at verse 2, and they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. I mean, you know, they had, they had a mortgage bust back then, too, you know. They had houses getting turned upside down back then, too, in one way or another. They take them away, so they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which you shall not remove your necks. You know, God, we think that things are so unfair in the world today, but God sees all that stuff. He sees these people that devise ways to get over. Uh, we talked about it when we were reading through Amos, how he said, you know, they'll sell you for a pair of shoes and make merchandise out of the people of God. And that's, what, that's what's being done. And that's what's being done today. And, but God sees it. You know, we say, God, do you, do you see what's going on? He sees everything that's going on. The thing is, when, when people speak words of judgment, everybody stops their ears because things are going so well, just like back in, in this day. When uh, during the time of Hezekiah and these other kings, you know, the, the nation of uh, it, Ju Judah, Judah and Benjamin, they were prospering. They were doing well. They were doing well financially, economically. They were doing well mil militarily. Everything was, was, was well with them. Uh, and they thought, well, hey, everything's, we're, we're sinning. We have these idols, but everything's going okay. So God must think it's all right. In God we trust. Uh, in chapter 2, look at verse, just drop down to verse 6 and just reading a little bit. He says, uh, 
Prophesy ye not. Say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. They, they, they had false prophets. They were, there were people who were standing up saying things, you know, the raw, raw, they were like, I always call them the cheerleaders. They, you know, they had, they had cheerleaders. They would stand up and, and they would say anything was all right as long as, you know, as long as it was acceptable. So, you know, today we have false prophets that will tell people anything, anything they want to hear, okay? Uh, they had them back then. Uh, he goes on and he says, uh, O you that are named the house of Jacob, in verse 7, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walks uprightly? Even of late my people was risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with garment from the, them that pass by securely as men averse for war. And he goes on and he talks about how they were just like playing games with God. They were playing church. They were, they were doing religion. They thought they were pleasing God because... You know, they were doing the thing. They were doing the God thing, but it was all fake. It was false prophets. If you drop down to verse uh, 12, now even after all this, and again, we see this, this, this pattern. Thank God that even though there were false prophets, there were people who were lying, there were people who were taking advantage. Again, he promises restoration. Now, I want to keep going to that theme, you know, judgment, restoration. Verse 12, he says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep at Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of, on the head of them. He's looking forward again to the second coming of Christ. When Jesus will come and he'll set his foot on the Mount of Olives and restore the nation of Israel to be the, the leaders of the world. And again, we see today, if you watch in the news, where's the hot spot? Where's, you've heard me say this so many times, the center of all the problems that we're dealing with right now is right there in the nation of Israel. That's, that's where they're talking nuclear war. You know, they're talking Iraq and Iran. We'll, we'll see that. We'll look further a little bit and see more of that. Uh, look at chapter 3. He talks about the sins of the rulers, the sins of the prophets. Uh, look at chapter 3. He says, And I, I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil? Now, this is, he's talking to the leaders of that nation. They hate the good, they love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot as flesh within the cauldron. In other, he's saying, you're, you're feasting off my, off my people. You're getting, you're getting wealthy. You're getting rich. You're getting powerful on the backs of the people that you're supposed to govern. Whatever happened, somebody said there's a difference between a politician and a statesman. There used to be people in, Paul, in, in government that were statesmen, that were leaders, that felt that they had a calling. And there, there probably still are uh, people in government. Somebody, I, was, I, was, I heard somewhere, and I can't remember where it was, there's 100 congressmen that get together and pray. In the United States Congress right now, there's 100 of them that get together and pray like once a week or a couple times a week, Democrats and Republicans. They get together and they pray. Thank God there's, there's men of God in, in Congress. I, believe, I, I thank God they're there. Uh, you know, we need to pray for them. We need to pray that they have an influence there. But there are those who are in government that are only interested in one thing, money and power. Well, those are two things, but they're the same. Money and power, they're, they're interested in control. They're interested in control, just like it was back then. It says, verse 4, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at the time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. You know, when the trouble comes, how many remember when they all stood on the steps of the Capitol and saying, God bless America? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. yeah, remember that? Well, you know, how, 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 how many of them meant that? I'm really waiting to get those, those DVDs about the Harbingers. I've, I've ordered them a long time ago. I guess they're really backed up about 9-11 and, and the warning signs of 9-11. But that's, I don't want to, I don't want to get into that. There's, that's going to be a different thing. All right. The, uh, they were the sins of the rulers. Look at the, look at verse 5, the sins of the prophets. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. The prophets that make my people err. I've said this before. If, if anybody that stands behind, they have to realize, if you stand behind a pulpit, you have people who are listening to what you're saying. And while, you know, we all make choices, we all make decisions, people listen to what you say. When you go out on, you know, for those of you that might witness and tell others about Jesus Christ, 
You need to pray, God, give me the words to say. And let them see Christ in you, because if you say one thing and do another, you're going to cause them to err. You're going to cause them to err. When people stand behind the pulpit, there have been people, that have preachers in, in, in this, uh, in, in our, since I've been saved, who stood behind the pulpit and say one thing and then live their lives doing something else. And they cause people to err. We're going to be held responsible. This is why I get it when people say they want to be a, a preacher or teacher. Or they want to speak. I say, man, do you know what you do? You really know what you want to do? You know, they think it's something to stand up because, and talk about God's word and stand in front of people and talk. Listen, the words you say can affect somebody's eternity. And the prophets of that time were causing people to err. And there are prophets and preachers and teachers today that are sending people straight to hell. Because they're not telling them the truth. They're not telling them about the blood. They're not telling them about their sin. They'll tell them how to be successful. They'll tell them how to be prosperous. They'll tell them how to succeed. But they won't tell them how to get saved. And people eat that stuff up. You know, they, they want to be prosperous. They want to be motivated. But nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to get there. It says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets of verse 5, that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, peace, and he that puts not into their mouths, uh, they even prepare war against him. Therefore night shall be unto you, that you shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, and you shall not divine, and the sun will go down over the prophets, and the day will be dark all over, and there will come a time the prophets won't be able to see nothing. They won't even be able to prophesy lies. They'll be, they'll be dried up. Then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners confounded. They shall all covet their lips for their, cover their lips for there is no answer of God. There's coming a time when the power and the anointing of God is going to shut the false prophets up. It's coming. When, when darkness covers the face of this earth and when, when things start to happen, they're not going to have anything to say. Just like in, in the time, if you remember the story, and I keep going back to the story of Ahab, who wanted to go into battle, and he called his prophets, he called his cheerleaders out, and they all said, go up, Ahab, go ahead, go ahead, Ahab, go to battle, you're going to win. And there was one guy who was, he had in prison, they drug him out, and he said, if, if you come back, I'm not a prophet. Ahab didn't come back. See, we need to be careful who we listen to. Just because, just because there's a majority doesn't mean they're right. Okay? All right, now. Uh, Look at, look at just, just dropping down. Uh, look at chapter, look at chapter, four. Well, look at the, the, the summary. Look at verse 9. He says, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire. It's all, it's a business. It's a business. Government is no longer service. It's, 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 a, it's a job. You get, you get 100% pension. Serve six years and you get a pension for the rest of your life, 100%. Okay, but ministry is no longer a calling. It's a job. I mean, go get a big church with a couple thousand people. In it. And, you know, it's, it's, they do it for hire. And they, the prophets there have divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. It's a business. Religion has become a big business, especially in the United States of America. Big Christianity has become a big business. A lot of money flowing. A lot of money coming and going. But very little preaching and teaching of God's word. Now, I won't say that. There's, there's a lot of preachers. There's a lot of teachers. Please forgive me. But the ones who are really making the big bucks are the ones who are peddling falseness. You know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good preachers and teachers. There's, there's good ones on TV. There's a lot of good churches. I'm not... You know, I don't want to, sometimes we get the mentality like Elijah and circle the wagons. And say, we're the only ones. We're not. There's a lot of good preachers and teachers. But the thing is, the ones who are really getting, the ones with the bully pulpit, they call it, are the ones with the big crowds, the ones that are telling them your, your best life now. You know, you can succeed now, okay? All right. Chapter 4. Just uh, in chapter 4, if you read it, and again, <laughs> We're, I'm just going to just, I want to get to chapter 5, but just if you read chapter 4, here's, here's what you'll see. In the last days, there's a promise of the restoration again. Again, we're seeing judgment, restoration. He talks about universal peace, 
universal prosperity, spiritual commitment, and eternal nation under the Messiah. Chapter 4 talks about how when, when, when everything is said and done, I believe it was Jeremiah said, my law will be written on your hearts. No longer will you have to go to one another and teach each other because you'll know me. That's when Christ returns again, sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, the nation of Israel will become a saved nation. When they, when they see their king, when they see their Messiah, and they see the holes in his hands, and they'll say, where did you get these, where did you get these holes in your hands? They'll say, I received them in the house of my friends. That's when they'll realize, that's when they'll repent of what they had done as a nation. Now, there are saved Jews today. There are many Jews who, that have received Christ. But I'm talking about Israel as a nation, okay? Chapter 4, you can read that. Please do. And, but I really want to get to chapter 5 because this is, this is like a phenomenal chapter. Because it really talks about the, the coming of Christ, clearly. And uh, it's actually quoted in the New Testament. Look at chapter 5, and starting at verse 1. And he says this. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, you know, when, when, the, when the kings came, to find the Messiah, the, 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 the Magi. I almost said the three kings, but we don't know how many there were. Okay. We say just in Habit, we say these three kings, right? We don't know how many. There might have been a hundred of them. But when the, when the Magi came from Babylon, uh, from Chaldea, and they, and they said, we're looking for the, we saw his sign in the heavens. We saw, we saw the sign of, the, of the, uh, the, 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 the new king. And they came to Herod. And they said, where's the new king? Well, Herod didn't know about any new king. He didn't want to hear about no new king. He was the king. Herod didn't like hearing about other kings, right? So the first thing he did was he went to, his, to the scribes, and he asked them, he says, where, where will Messiah be born? I mean, Herod knew who they were talking about. He said, where will Messiah be born? And what did they quoted right here. They quoted this verse. Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travails has brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. He's seeing here in these few verses the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. He's saying they're going to be, he's going to be smitten. Just like Isaiah in chapter 53 talked about, you know, the suffering, the suffering Savior. That's the, that's the chapter that the Jews don't read in the synagogue, Orthodox Jews. They, they skip over that chapter because it speaks of Jesus. He talks about the birthplace of the Messiah. Uh, and he said that Israel will be given up. In verse 3, he says that because of their rejection of the Messiah, they will be given up until his return, until the time of their repentance. See, now, when Jesus was crucified, and if you go back and you read like Matthew chapter 23, he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was his last public discourse before his crucifixion. And what he was saying was, when you see me again, see, when he returns again and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, like it says in Zechariah, when he comes back for his second coming and establishes his kingdom, the nation of Israel will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's when they will own him. After they repent of rejecting him, that's when they will own him as their Messiah. So here in Micah, 2,700 years uh, before this, 700 years, 750 years before Christ, he saw the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And he pronounced it. He says, reading on here a little bit, in verse 4, And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord God. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. He's speaking of his second coming. And this man shall be the peace. He shall be the peace. The prince of peace. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There'll be no peace in Jerusalem until Jesus returns. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying for the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Don't know who those seven shepherds and eight principal men are. I don't know. I don't know what those refer to. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with a sword and the land of Nimrod. What he's predicting here is the end time battle when the then the Israelites will be victorious against the armies of the world because of the coming of Jesus Christ. The land of Nimrod, where's that? In the land of Assyria, Iraq, and Iran. You know, we know that the Bible predicts a war uh, with, with Russia in, in Iran, uh, joining forces, Gog and Magog, Ezekiel predicted this war, Ezekiel 37, and so forth. And these things are coming to pass. And Micah is saying, listen, this, when that does, when they all gather, they're going to gather in a place called the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon. See, I've said this, and it's my belief, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but people talk about the battle of Armageddon. I don't think the battle's not going to be in Armageddon. That's where they gather. The battle's going to be over Jerusalem. That's going to be the city of blood. That's going to be the cup of trembling to all the world. And all these armies from the east and from the west talk about a 200 million man army coming from the Orient. It's mentioned, right? That's a big army. They're all going to gather. They're all going to gather to take that city, Jerusalem, all over Jerusalem. That's when Jesus is going to come back. That's when he's going to come back with a sword coming out of his mouth and the word of God. That's when he's going to come back and the slaughter is going to... He, you know what? He's not going to have to fire one shot. It's just with his word. He's going to bring judgment. It says in verse 7, And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarries not for man, nor waits for the sons of man. Verse 8, And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest. Listen, the nation of Israel will be risen up as the leaders of the world. Jesus Christ will be the king, and his nation Israel will be his, will be his nation. People will go to Jerusalem to worship the king. And the nations of the world during that time of the, the time of the millennial reign will all go, the ones who were left after the tribulation, they will all go to worship the king in Jerusalem. I thank the Lord that I, I'm worshiping him here right now. You know, I'm, I thank God. You know, see, that's why we sang, we sang that song. You know, uh, we're blessed if we bow our knee here. You're a whole lot better off than if you wait. Okay, because I don't know how many folks are going to make it through that tribulation. I want to bow my knee here. I want to do it now. I want to worship him now. He says, Your hand shall be lifted up upon your adversaries. This is in verse 9. And all your enemies shall be cut off. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off the horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. And I will cut off the cities of the land, and throw down all thy strongholds. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Hallelujah. No more psychic network going on. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The graven images also will I cut off, no more American idol. And, they, and the, thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. Hallelujah. When Jesus comes back, there's only going to be one object of worship. And that will be the Messiah, the King, who will reign for a thousand years before the new heaven and the new earth come. Okay? Hallelujah. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee. That word grove, that was like a, 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 an item of worship. So will I destroy thy cities. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the, the, the heathen such as they have not heard. The day of the Lord is coming. I want to be on the right side. I want to be on his side. Amen? A few more chapters, and then we're, we're going to close. Chapter 6, and we're just going to jump through here quickly. The, the, the verse in chapter 6, that it talks about repentance. Somebody said, what do I got to do? Look at uh, verse 6 of chapter 6. Here a few a month or so ago, uh, Pastor Harold preached on this. He says, wherewith shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Does he want the religious thing going on? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Tell me, what do I got to do to get right with God? We can fill in all the blanks, you know, things that people have told us and religions that, you know, certain religions that teach you got to do this or do that or whatever. Here's what he says. He showed me, oh man, what is good. And what does God require of thee? Here it is. But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. What does God want? He's not concerned about the outward expression. He's worried about the inward reality. See, it was, it was like that 2,700 years ago, and it's like that today. And there's a whole lot of folks sitting up in churches worried about the outward thing, and, they're, and they don't really care that much about the inward. You know, I've, I've said this before, and in this, in this church, and a lot of churches that came out of, like, the holiness revival, you know, holiness used to mean a list of rules, a list of ways you had to dress, okay? When Rose and I first started um, going to Church of God functions, they were in the transition of, of, of giving up the, the legalism thing. And some of them still kind of hold on to it. But we would go to, like, prayer conferences, and it would be like, you know, none of the women would have any earrings on. No makeup, no slacks, okay? But, but they could wear a pin like this big. <laughs> I guess that, was, that wasn't in the rule book, all right? But they didn't, they didn't have all this other stuff on. And, and we used to think, and there, there, was, there, was, there was a change, you know, a changeover, because they realized that that was like very, all, all that was were, were a bunch of rules. And I said this before, and the guy said this at the prayer conference. He said, all the rules, they all apply to the women, you know, because the men made all the rules, you know. So they, they made all the rules. They applied to the women. So they talked about hair and earrings and jewelry. You know, the men, they didn't have to worry about anything. You know, they just, uh, <laughs> they, like I said, they weren't allowed to chew snuff in church. We went, we went, uh, went I, and I'll just, it's just a brief story. When Rose and I first got married, we were going to Church of God. I think it was either, I think I had to buy a, a minutes book. The Church of God, they have what they call the minutes book, which is the rule, you know, what they have, you know, the way it's set up the government and so forth. And studying for ministry, I had to get a minutes book. So I ordered, I went to Pathway Press Catalog, and we didn't have internet then. And, and I ordered, I saw Church of God Minutes. And I got it, and I started reading it. I said, wow. Because they were talking, they were saying, like, you know, women couldn't cut their hair, and if they did, they'd be thrown out. And, and here, I accidentally bought a copy of, like, the very first minutes book from, like, 1906, okay? So I was like, oh, man, I, said, I don't know about this. I said, I said, Rose, you can't cut your hair, <laughs> you know. But that's the, way they, that's the way they used to be in, in the holiness churches. They thought, they thought it was an outward thing. You had to dress a certain way. And, you know, there's, you know we should dress modestly and so forth. Okay, I understand that. But, but they, they made it a big list of rules. But here's what, here's what Micah says. He says, it's not about that. He says, you do justly, and you love mercy, and you walk humbly with God. Be just, have love, and be humble. That's what... When you, it all boils down to, that's like the bottom line. What, if we want to go out and win souls to Christ, what do they need to see? Jesus. They need to see just, yes. love, yes. humble. Yes. Just, love, humble, fair. You know, that's, that's what God wants from us. That's what he wanted from them. It's no different. He's looking for the internal qualities. Yes. If you get the, you know what, if you get the internal qualities right, the external things will follow. If you seek first the kingdom of God, all those things will be added. Because that's what he's talking about right here. Here's a picture of Jesus Christ. Just, love, humble. Creator of the world. He, he knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples. Just, love, humble. Okay? Now, just in closing, chapter 7. And uh, in chapter 7, we read about sorrow and about hope. He says, just starting at verse 1, and we'll just read a little bit and then we'll close. The prophet writes, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits and as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desires the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. Doesn't it seem that way sometimes? They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly, the prince asks, and the judge asks for a reward. Man, <laughs> they take bribes. They do it for money. They, they, want, they, want, they, they do it for the lobbyists. 
And the great man, he utters his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lies in thy bosom. For the son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. This is quoted, Jesus quoted this. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. Listen, when everybody else is letting you down, we got one place we can turn. I thank God I got a good wife, I can confide in her, she confides in me. But ultimately, I have to look to God. There's some things she can't do. There's some things I can't do. You know, we have friends that we can confide in. But there's a sometimes you just need to take it to the Lord. There's sometimes you don't need to share. You know, you need to be careful who you share stuff with. You know, there might be in my life, I, I, there might be one or two people other than my wife that I can really share things with. And that's not putting other people down. That's just the way it is. You need to be careful. You need to find one or two people that you can confide in that you know isn't going to take what you tell them and spread it everywhere. But ultimately, even they, even they, even those really close ones, Sometimes I'm going to be there for you. But God is always there. He's always there. When there's nobody to turn to, he's always there. And I think sometimes he gets us in a place where we can't find anybody who will listen to us. Just so we'll start talking to him. Because, you know, he'll listen to us. Just reading a little bit more, we're going to close. Uh, Look at, look at verse 8, and just let this be an encouragement to you. Well, verse 7, Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall. I shall arise when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me, he will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Think of these promises he's making. How much more can we say these things that we have looked, we can look back on the cross. You know, Micah was 750 years from Christ. He was looking forward. He might not have had a clear understanding of the nature of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. But we have that, we have the privilege. Jesus said, Abraham would have loved to live in your day. We have the privilege of knowing the full counsel of God. We have the completed word. And we can look back, and we can know and be convinced and be assured that we have a God. We have a, a Christ who's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He says, just dropping down, and there's so, again, there's so much here. But look at verse 16, and we're going we're to close. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, they shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth, and shall be afraid of the Lord our God. There's no fear of God now in the world. Nobody cares about what God says. Nobody cares about what he thinks. The leaders of the world, they, they really don't care. The heathen are raging, making plans against the Lord of the, the God of Israel. But there's going to come a time when all the nations shall fear because of Christ. Who is a God like unto you that pardons iniquity? Oh, listen, just, we'll just end with these verses and, and wrap your mind around these things, you know, because we're talking about judgment and mercy. Who is a God like unto you that pardons my iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Thank the Lord he doesn't count my sins against me. Not because I deserve it but because of what Christ did. He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He doesn't stay mad at us. Hallelujah. He'd rather be merciful. <laughs> he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He, he, and he's not going to bring them up again. He's not going to hold them against us again. I said one time, you know, I don't believe God absolutely forgets everything because he's God. He knows everything. But he, he's not going to bring them up to us again. He's not going to hold them against us. 
You know, there are people sometimes that we've offended and they'll say, oh, I forgive you. But, you know, they flip that thing out every once in a while, you know, okay. God buries this. He closes his prophecy by saying, you will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And we can be convinced that we don't have to be afraid. You know, there's a lot of trouble that comes upon the earth, and all of us suffer struggles in our lives, things happening. But I thank God that we have a God. We, we talked Sunday morning about going boldly to the throne, taking our request to him with confidence and assurance. I thank the Lord that before the cross, before you know, everything we know, he was the, he's the same God. He judges sin, but he offers mercy. And he's given us these promises, these prophecies that were, filled, were fulfilled in Christ's first coming and the, and the fulfillment that will come at the second coming. These are what we have to look forward to as believers. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm glad, I'm glad I know Jesus Christ. I'm glad God saved me when he did. I can say I wish I would have got saved 10 years earlier. It doesn't matter. I'm just glad I'm saved. I'm glad I know the truth. I'm glad I don't have to, I don't have to be concerned when I, when I hear, read the news and see what's going on in the Middle East. I don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Because we have a God that's taking care of all that. He told us it was going to happen before it happened. Amen? Amen. Anybody have any questions or comments? Or? Yes, Carol. Yes, I, I believe, yeah, because it's, it's going to be on this earth. It's, you know, that's before, that's before the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth will be eternity. But yeah, it'll be the same earth, the same solar system, the same. Well, we're not going to get old. I mean, we're going to have the resurrected body. We're going to be, you know, so we won't be, we won't be getting old. I hope not. I don't want to be a thousand years old. I'm having trouble being 58 right now. I don't know. I'll make a thousand. Anybody else have a comment or a question or anything at all before we close? Anything at all? Yes, sir. I was going to say, um, you know, for those of you who have the uh, prayer, um, see, see yes. That's right. Because uh, we, you have to stand up and, and, and yes. speak the truth. You, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you can love, you, I think I said it in the middle you can love somebody straight in the head. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You can love them. If they're doing something that's against the word of God, you tell that's them right. the truth in love. You've got to tell them the truth in love. Actually, if you don't tell them the truth, you're not loving them. That's right. That's right. You know. And, and I, I, was, I was thinking, I, I can't tell you how many times, I've been doing this for like 20 years now. And uh, there have been times that people have come to me after preaching a message. Uh, anybody here have preached for, people come to me and say, and they'll say, uh, hey, they'll say, uh, were you talking to someone? <laughs> and I'll say, yeah, I've never, in 20 years, I've never, I've never done that. I've never said, oh, so-and-so's here, so I'm going to preach. I've never done that. But when you preach the truth, it's going it's to hit somebody. And sometimes, most of the time, it hits the pastor first. 
But if, you, if you're worried about pleasing everybody, but listen, if you pastor a church, and we got, well, how many people in church on a Sunday morning? 60 people. That if you try to please everybody, you drive yourself nuts. <laughs> if you're worried about what you, you know, well, if I say this, so-and-so is going to be mad. If I say, you drive yourself crazy. So that's why I figured I'll just keep reading from God's word. They can't argue with they can take They can argue with that. I, I, told, you, I told you a story that in the, in the congregational churches in the, during colonial times, they would have people uh, that would shout out the names of people that the preacher was talking about. You know, the preacher started talking about, a, started talking about you know, something, and somebody would say, this is for brother so-and-so, <laughs> you know. And then they would have people, if somebody would fall asleep, they'd throw something at them to wake them up. I haven't seen them gifts. I haven't seen them gifts in the Bible, so I don't know. Yes, John. Yes. Yeah, they, they, put you, they put you in stocks. They, you know, you're required to. It was, yeah, you know, throw tomatoes at you. It was, it was like, you know, it was a requirement. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the early explorers, they came over here in the name of Jesus with guns. And they conquered the, you know, the Aztecs and the Incas in, in South America, Central America. They wiped, they wiped their civilizations out in the name of Jesus because they wanted the gold. <laughs> they wanted the, you know, they wanted the power. And they, and they did that. That was, you know, they had flags with crosses on them. That's why, that's why a lot of Native Americans really don't, don't celebrate Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, because they, at the end of, if, if you, um, uh, don't get me started, but when they came over, he, John mentioned Jamestown. If, I remember here a couple years ago, they were celebrating, it was like 400 years or 500 years from Jamestown. That was 16, 16 something, uh, 1604, 1606 or something. But, but they, they, uh, they were celebrating, you know, anniversary of Jamestown. And uh, they were talking about, I, I was reading the, the compact that, I think it was King James that signed, Jamestown, King James. He signed and he was saying, we're claiming this land for the Lord, our Jesus Christ, the Lord, our God, blah, 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 all this other stuff. But it sounded good. Then right after that, he had where he was dividing the land up among the landowners, the, the ones that went there. I'm thinking, what about the, the Indians who were there? That was their land. <laughs> he started cutting up land that didn't belong to him, but in the name of Jesus. But uh, anyway, okay. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to say? I don't, I don't get me rambling on that because I'll, I'll be here for it. Any other, any other comments or questions or anything? Okay. God is good, isn't he? Praise the Lord. All right. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Father, we do love you and we thank you for this uh, word. And we thank you, Lord, for the promises. Lord, that your word is so true and so good. Father, you predicted things that would happen hundreds, thousands of years before they happened. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us have great faith in your word, Lord, that you would help us continue to look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, that you would help us be about your business, help, help us live justly, have love, and have mercy, Father. Father, I pray, God, you would help us be the men and women of God you've called us to be, that we would seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, and you would add all these things unto us. Father, forgive us for those times that we've turned our backs on you. Forgive us for those times that we've allowed ourselves to be distracted by stuff, by things, by situations. Father, forgive us for those times we've allowed ourselves to be distracted by people. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us always remember that the admonition you have in your word, Father. Help us tell somebody about Jesus this week. Help us be a blessing. Some We pray for our brother John Shelton and Dick Samuels and the ones who are with him, Father. Just give them Godspeed in the name of Jesus. And we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. Shake some.